Welcome back, everyone, to our Sunday School series on the doctrine of Scripture, where we are describing and defending the classical Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura. We only have four lessons to go for the class. So you can see that in our spinach acronym, we still have necessity, authority, canonicity, and historicity remaining. So we're going to cover necessity this week. Next week, I will not be teaching because we're going to have a special lesson taught by John Schultz uh, in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the PCA, uh, which will be actually, I think the official date of the PCA, its founding was December 4th, 1973 at Briarwood Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama. So yes, we'll be celebrating 50 years with a special Sunday School lesson taught by John Schultz next week. But I'll be back the following week to talk about the authority of Scripture, and then we'll have canonicity and historicity. We will not be having a Sunday School class on Christmas Eve, so that will bring us all the way through the end of December then. So four lessons to go. Uh, and so if you were not with us last week, we did a lesson answering objections to the doctrine of biblical inerrancy. And I focused on five objections in particular. Objection one, the Bible only needs to be inerrant in matters of faith and practice. Objection two, inerrancy is a modern rationalistic concept. Objection three, the biblical authors accommodated their messages to the understanding of their readers. Objection four, inerrancy is a misleading concept since there are no inerrant manuscripts. And objection five, if inerrancy is unnecessary for Scripture's transmission and translation, then it's unnecessary for Scripture's composition as well. I'm not going to get back into all that we said on these objections. If you were not with us last week, I would encourage you to check out the recording of last week's lesson, which I've uploaded to my YouTube channel. So all of these lessons are available online for you to listen to. Today, though, we're going to be focusing on the necessity of Scripture, and I wanted to begin by giving you some quotes from some of the early Reformed confessional documents, beginning with our own confessional document, the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is the very opening paragraph of the Westminster Confession. Paragraph 1 of chapter 1 of the Confession of Faith says, Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness of wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of his will, which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore, it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church. And afterwards, for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh, and the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same wholly unto writing, which maketh the Holy Scripture to be most necessary. Those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people now being ceased. That is actually just one single sentence. They, they, they had some pretty long sentences back then. But you get the main idea here, right? The opening paragraph of the Westminster Confession is emphasizing the necessity of Scripture. It is the foundation for our faith. That is why it is so necessary. It does acknowledge that it is not the only form of revelation. There is another form of revelation alluded to in the, the opening clause. What is the other form of revelation? It's general revelation. And so we're going to say some things about general revelation as well. Or as it's referred to in the Confession of Faith, the light of nature. Those terms are basically synonymous. The terminology of general and special revelation, as far as I know, only emerged in the 19th century. You don't find the early reform sources using those terms. They prefer to speak of the natural knowledge of God or the supernatural knowledge of God, the light of nature, um, uh, the light of revelation, but they don't use the terms general and special revelation. That might be one of the contributions of the Princeton theologians, just like the term inerrancy. Uh, but there is another confessional document uh, from the early Reformed period in the early 17th century. Are you all familiar with the Canons of Dort? So the, uh, this is one of the confessional documents for the continental Reformed churches. There were three main uh, confessional documents that they used, which together are known as the three forms of unity. The Canons of Dort is one of those confessional documents. Does anyone know the other two? Heidelberg Catechism, Heidelberg Catechism and there's one more? Belgian. The Belgic Confession. Very good. 
So the Canons of Dort, I believe, was the last of those three to be written. It was written in response to the Arminians in the Dutch Reformed Church. They were known as the Remonstrants at the time. And so the Dutch Reformed Church gathered together at the Synod of Dort. I believe it was around 1618, 1619. And they wrote up their own confessional document in response to the Arminians. And this is one of those articles that they said. Um, They say, There is, to be sure, a certain light of nature, there's that expression again, remaining in all people after the fall, by virtue of which they retain some notions about God, natural things, and the difference between what is moral and immoral, and demonstrate a certain eagerness for virtue and for good outward behavior. So it's important for us to acknowledge this as Reformed Christians. Um, And I've said this before in previous lessons. There is a difference between the doctrine of total depravity and the doctrine of utter depravity. Do you all know what the difference is between total depravity and utter depravity? Total depravity is the confessional reformed teaching, that we are corrupt in every aspect of our being, that we are wholly unable to do anything that can merit God's approval or favor. Utter depravity would be that we are as wicked as we could possibly be all the time, like we're all just little Hitlers running around thinking, how evil can I be today? That's not the same thing. Here's an analogy that I like to use to distinguish total depravity from utter depravity. Imagine that you have a a crystal clear, cool glass of drinking water, and then you take the world's deadliest poison, and you just put a single drop of that poison into the glass, and you stir it up as much as you can so that the poison becomes completely diluted. What's going to happen if you take just one single sip of that water? It's going to kill you, right? If it's the deadliest poison in the world, even just a single sip is going to kill you. That would be like total depravity. Utter depravity would be like you take that same glass of water, you dump out all the water, and you fill it all the way up with pure poison. You see the difference there? We still have the remaining vestiges of our human nature, so the image of God has not been completely eradicated by the fall, but we are no longer of, a, uh, of attaining any spiritual merit, We can no longer do anything that uh, merits God's approval. Everything we do will be tainted by sin to some extent. So that is how the um, canons of Dort begin in this paragraph, by acknowledging that point. But this light of nature is far from enabling humans to come to a saving knowledge of God and conversion to him. So far, in fact, that they do not use it rightly, even in matters of nature and society. So even the good that has been retained, despite the fall, is still twisted. Even though it's not wholly eradicated, what does remain is still twisted to some uh, some extent. And instead, in various ways, they completely distort this light, whatever its precise character, and suppress it in unrighteousness. In doing so, all people render themselves without excuse before God. So, this is an acknowledgement of what happens apart from the saving revelation of Scripture. These passages from these confessional documents give us some of the building blocks to start to develop a doctrine of special revelation, in contrast to general revelation. Now, this is rooted in what Scripture itself teaches about these two forms of revelation. There are a couple key biblical texts that are frequently cited in discussions on the doctrine of general revelation. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Psalm 19. It's one of the best-known psalms, and it begins with these words. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So, this is an affirmation that heaven itself is a revelation of God. It declares something about the character, the glory of God. Similarly, a key passage in the New Testament would be Romans 1. Beginning in verse 18, where the Apostle Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Okay, so again, we're getting an idea of how general revelation functions. 
Paul himself acknowledges that God's existence, his attributes are clearly known through creation. And we know that. Everyone knows that. But how do we respond to that revelation? Well, those who are not renewed by the Holy Spirit suppress that truth. They resist it. They deny it. And instead, they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. That's what Paul is getting at here in this passage. And so, um, we have these two principles within the human heart that are sort of at war with one another. There's this natural knowledge of God, which all humans possess, and yet there's this idolatrous inclination to suppress and distort that truth. And so, that is the condition we're left with if all we had was general revelation. So building upon that, we can start to come up with a systematic description of how general revelation differs from special revelation. Now, in previous lessons in this class, do you remember how I've used Aristotle's four causes? Does anybody remember I used like the analogy of the house to describe these four types of causes? So Aristotle said that anything that exists can be described in terms of its four causes. And so with the example of a house, we could say that the formal cause of a house would be the blueprints. Whatever exists fits some kind of design pattern for what that thing is supposed to be, which makes it what it is. Um, There is also necessarily an efficient cause. So uh, in the case of a house, that would be like the construction workers, the builder. Um, But those builders need materials to work with, and that would be the material cause. So for a house, that would be like the bricks or the wood or the nails, Uh, And then um, the final cause refers to the purpose of a thing. So what is the purpose of a house? Well, it's to provide a a dwelling place for for people, right, to live in. And so we could take these same categories to describe what is general revelation and what is special revelation. So in terms of the formal cause, what is the kind of thing that each one is? Well, they're both forms of communication. But where they differ is that general revelation is nonverbal, whereas special revelation is verbal. It's communicated to us in words. The efficient cause, what is it that actually brings this revelation to us? Well, all of creation does so for general revelation. So just open your eyes, reflect on the nature of the world around you, or you could also look inward at your own conscience, or um, as John Calvin um, referred to, the uh, sensus divinitatis, that's that divine sense, a divine instinct implanted within every human heart which gives us this immediate awareness that there is a being that we ought to worship. And so those are the the efficient causes that bring general revelation to us. Whereas special revelation today comes to us in the Bible, originally written by the prophets and the apostles. The material cause, that refers to the content of the revelation. So with respect to general revelation, the content of that revelation is God's existence and something about his attributes. So we see his wisdom, we see his power, we see his glory. Um, we, We see these things through general revelation. It doesn't reveal all of his attributes though. Um, so we don't see, um, his saving grace manifest in general revelation. That is what we see in special revelation. It is through special revelation that we hear about God's plan of salvation. How has God actually entered into history and acted for us to redeem us? That's what we learn about through scripture in special revelation. And what is the final cause, the purpose for general revelation and special revelation? Well, as those confessional documents we looked at said, as Paul said, um, they leave men without excuse. I think that expression is used in both Westminster and in the Canons of Dort and in Romans 1. Men are without excuse as a result of general revelation. So the purpose is to convict us of our sin, to help us to see the condition we are truly in, that we are lawbreakers by nature after the fall. And that gives us an awareness of the problem that we face, but it does not give us the solution. That is the purpose for special revelation. The purpose of special revelation is to give us the message of salvation so that if we respond in faith, we will be saved. Um, I also added a fifth category, which doesn't really fit Aristotle's causes, but there are different recipients to general and special revelation. General revelation is accessible to all human beings. Everyone with a rational mind is capable of perceiving general revelation and is responsible and accountable for it. On the other hand, special revelation is a particular verbal message that needs to be heard or read. And so it's not accessible to everyone naturally. 
These are some of the fundamental differences that we see. Um, And especially on that final point, special revelation is a message that needs to be heard. Therefore, we would say that special revelation is necessary for salvation. And this is clearly taught in Scripture. Let me give you one of the key biblical passages that affirms the necessity of special revelation for salvation. This comes from Paul's words in Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 17. Paul says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So, what Paul is describing here is a certain sequence. A sequence that is necessary for anyone to come to salvation. It begins with the missionary being sent, and that missionary preaches. And that preaching is then heard. Some respond to that hearing with believing, and that belief leads to salvation. So send, preach, hear, believe, be saved. That's the sequence, and that is a necessary sequence. That is the only way by which a person can reach the goal of salvation. And so there are other passages we could look at as well. Uh, Acts 4.12 is another commonly used biblical passage where it's the Apostle Peter says that there is no other name Uh, given among men under heaven by which we must be saved, referring to the name of Christ. And so um, we see this idea uh, frequently in Scripture that we need a word from God in order to be saved, and that word tells us about Christ. And so I can give you some categories here. These are the vocabulary terms that I have for you today, in addition to general and special revelation. But this is on your printout as well. And I've tried to describe the different views on salvation that different people affirm. And so the fundamental question is, how are we saved? At the narrowest level would be those who are described as exclusivists. The exclusivist view would say that special revelation is necessary to be saved. It's the narrowest view because it would say that those who are saved would be fewest in number. At a broader level would be the inclusivists. They would say that in some cases at least, maybe not in every case, but in some cases... Some people might be saved by rightly responding to general revelation, even apart from knowledge of special revelation. There have been some notable figures, even professing Christians, who have historically affirmed this view. Can you think of anybody that has taught this view? C.S. Lewis is one of the most notable examples of an inclusivist from the 20th century. Um, if, uh, and we're going to do uh, an entire series on his Chronicles of Narnia starting in January. And I'm going to comment on a scene from The Last Battle. You might remember the character Emmeth from that story. How many of you have actually read The Last Battle before? You know who the character Emmeth was? He was a soldier for the Calarmine army. His whole life, he was seeking Aslan, but worshiping Tash because that's the only god he knew because of his culture. But at the final judgment, when he's finally standing before Aslan, Aslan says, You worshipped Tash in ignorance, but you are seeking me. Therefore, all the worship that you gave to Tash, I will credit as towards me. And he's allowed into heaven. What Lewis is doing there is a pretty clear instance of the doctrine of inclusivism. And that is contrary to the historic Reformed understanding of salvation, uh, where we would affirm that, no, uh, to be saved, a person must respond in faith to the message of special revelation, that general revelation is not enough. But even broader than the inclusivist view would be the pluralist view. This would would be the view uh, that teaches that the various religions of the world are also paths to salvation. So you might have heard of the parable of the blind men and the elephant. You know, they're each like feeling a different part of the elephant, whether it's the ear or the tail or the, or the, the trunk. And they're each describing some aspect of the truth. And the point of the parable is to say, well, they're all correct. And so the idea is there are, there are many paths to God, and they are all valid paths, and so that would be the pluralist view. And then even beyond that would be the universalist view. Um, and this would be the, the, uh, the teaching that everyone will ultimately be saved. 
Um, even Satan himself could be saved on the universalist view. This was actually the teaching of uh, the early church father, Origen. At least that was the hope that he expressed. I'm not sure if it was something he clearly affirmed, but um, it was at least a hope that he had expressed in his writings. So um, these are the different understandings of salvation. And, and for this class, I'm going to be defending that narrowest view, the exclusivist view, that um, that script, Scripture is necessary for our salvation, that we need the message of Jesus Christ as presented in the Word of God in order to be saved. And I'm going to use a couple of sources to make this case. So what I intend to do with the remaining time of our class today is summarize the argument of Francis Turretin, who I've been using throughout this class, and also Kevin DeYoung in his book, Taking God at His Word. Now, uh, Turretin has a couple chapters on the necessity of revelation, and he distinguishes between verbal revelation and written revelation. So at the broader level, verbal revelation could be communicated either written in written form or oral form. And he's arguing at this broader level that we still need a verbal revelation from God in order to be saved. And he makes that point um, with two arguments based on the goodness of God and the twofold appetite of man, which I'm going to explain to you. And then his argument for written revelation, where he's specifically critiquing um, the Roman Catholic view of that time, which taught that, well, in some cases, tradition is sufficient for a person to be saved, that they don't actually need the written word of God for salvation as long as they have access to the traditions of the church. Um, and Turretin is critiquing that based on an argument from Scripture's preservation, vindication, and propagation. And then he goes on to answer a number of objections to this point. Um, and I'm not going to address all the objections that he addresses, but I'm going to give you like three of them. So let me begin um, by highlighting what he has to say about um, the necessity of special revelation even before the fall. And I think this is an idea that we also see taught within the Westminster Confession of Faith. And in fact, it is the basis for our doctrine of the covenant. Chapter 7 of the Westminster Confession of Faith is all about God's covenant with man. And it opens with these words. The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. So this is a description of human nature. Even before the fall, this was the state that Adam would have been in. So as a reasonable creature, he owed obedience to God. And yet, apart from covenant, he would never have had any fruition of God as, as his blessedness and reward. Now, there, there is some deliberate ambiguity in the confession on this point because different Westminster divines had different ways of understanding what is this fruition? What is this reward? Is it a, a heavenly reward beyond life in the Garden of Eden? Or is it just continued blessedness within the Garden? If you read different of the Westminster divines, they have different answers to that question. But they do all agree on the necessity of the covenant. And so that raises the question, what is a covenant? How would you answer that question? What is a covenant? It's an agreement. Tell me more. What kind of agreement? Is any agreement a covenant? Or is a covenant a special kind of agreement? Bond and blood. Very good. You guys have been reading O. Palmer Robertson, right? Yeah. So, yes, it is a solemn binding agreement between two parties. Um, as O. Palmer Robertson describes it, it's a bond in blood sovereignly administered. What I want to highlight in the definition of covenant is that there is a verbal component to it. When God makes a covenant with man, it requires that verbal, uh, uh, that the exchange of promises and obligations, right? And so that verbal dimension is a necessary component to what a covenant is. And that tells us that special revelation would have been necessary even before the fall. It's not just a response to man's sin, although it is that. But it's even more fundamental than that. It is necessary for Adam to, to attain the, the highest fruition of his relationship with God. And so that'll help you understand Turretin's arguments. He makes three arguments based on the goodness of God for the necessity of verbal revelation. Um, at the pre-fall level, Turretin argues, and I'm kind of paraphrasing him here, God made man for a supernatural end, which requires a supernatural knowledge. 
So um, the majority view um, and the view that Turretin held to was that Adam's reward would have been a, a, a heavenly glorified life. Um, you might be familiar with um, the, the fourfold state of man described as um, passe, picare, non-passe, non-picare, passe, non-picare, and then non-passe, picare. Am I just talking gibberish to you or does anybody have an idea of what I'm saying there? Uh, so before the fall, man was able to sin. After the fall, he is unable to not sin. Redeemed in Christ, he is able to not sin. And then glorified in heaven, he is unable to sin. Okay, that's what I mean by those terms. And so if we think about the difference between the, the state of creation and the state of glory, there is a condition of able to sin versus unable to sin. And in that higher glorified state, Turretin argues, it would have required a covenant. It would have required the supernatural knowledge that comes by God condescending voluntarily to his creatures to reveal this knowledge and this means to them. That's Turretin's first argument. And that necessity is compounded even further after the fall because now we have no way of meeting the terms of that covenant. So, you know, within the Reformed Presbyterian system, we talk about the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Well, we are covenant breakers by nature now. We cannot meet the terms of the covenant of works. And so, um, Turretin goes on to say in his second argument here, under the goodness of God, sinful man still has some remaining light in earthly things. That's what the canons of Dort had said previously. But in heavenly things, he is so blind that he needs divine guidance. We, we cannot do this on our own. We need the assistance of God through his spirit, through his revelation, um, in order to receive the heavenly reward that was initially promised before the fall. And then Turretin also makes an, uh, an empirical argument based on the fact of world religions. Look at how um, false religions emerge, where you have someone claiming to have a, a divine revelation from God. So think of the examples of like Islam or Mormonism and so on and so forth. There's prophets from Eastern religions as well. Turretin argues that religious imposters would not have succeeded in promoting false revelation unless men naturally felt a need for such revelation. In other words, these false religions are scratching a real itch. And that itch shows us that we need something beyond ourselves, that we need something that we cannot attain to naturally. Um, so that's his point. That is related to this next point where he talks about the twofold appetite of man. There are sort of two longings that he observes within the human soul. This twofold nat uh, appetite naturally implanted in man proves this. One for truth, the other for immortality. One for knowing the truth, the other for enjoying the highest good that the intellect may be completed by the contemplation of truth and the will by the fruition of good in which a happy life consists. But since these appetites cannot be in vain, a revelation was necessary to show the first truth and the highest good and the way to each, which nature could not do. In other words, Turretin is arguing that within the human heart, there is a desire, a longing for both truth and a longing for goodness. And to know both of those, in their fullest sense, we can't attain those naturally. There is something, the source of truth and goodness has to come down to us to give us that knowledge. So in this case, nature is showing us the itch, but the supernatural is the only means to scratch that itch. I think this idea is brilliantly described by C.S. Lewis. You might be familiar with this quote from Mere Christianity. How many of you have actually read Mere Christianity before at some point? Okay, some of you. You might recall this quote. It's one of the most famous quotes from the book. Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. Let me back up. Notice how Turton says these appetites cannot be in vain. Turton is making that same point. He's just saying it in a much more technical scholastic way. I like Lewis's way of putting it, though. Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction of those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it 
to suggest the real thing. So in other words, we have this longing within the human heart that can only be satisfied by a word from God. We need a supernatural knowledge to satisfy a natural desire. Are you getting that point? So this is one of the points that emphasizes our need for special revelation. And then Turton goes on to argue for the necessity of written revelation. And he does so based on an argument on Scripture's preservation, vindication, and propagation. Here's a quote from Turton. So again, keep in mind the context here. He's responding to um, Roman Catholics who would argue that in some cases written Scripture would not be necessary for a person's salvation if they have access to the... um, the church's priesthood and its traditions, right, and its sacramental system. But Turretin says, no, we need Scripture. He says, it was necessary for a written word to be given to the church that the canon of true religious faith, we've talked about the rule of faith before, the regula fidei, I think that's what he's getting at here, might be constant and unmoved, that it might easily be preserved pure and entire against the weakness of memory, the depravity of men, and the shortness of life that it might be more certainly defended from the frauds and corruptions of Satan, that it might be more conveniently not only be sent to the absent and widely separated, but also be transmitted to posterity. Nor for any other reason are the public laws, statutes, and edicts of kings, and the decrees of the commonality inscribed upon brass or committed to public tablets, except that this is the most sure method of preserving them uncorrupted and of propagating through many ages the remembrance of those things which it is important for the people to know. Uh, Let me use an analogy here to help make sense of this. What document was our nation founded on? The Constitution, right? We would say that like when we were founded, you know, yes, Declaration of Independence before that when we broke away from the British Empire, but the document that really founded us as a nation was the Constitution. What is necessary for us to know the contents of the Constitution? We have to have the Constitution in written form, right? It needs to be in writing. That's the only way that we can reliably preserve that document, is in written form. So, Turton is making an analogy from human laws to the the divine word of God. Just as we write down human laws for their preservation and propagation, so we need to do the same thing for God's word as well. That is his argument for um, the necessity of written scripture. And then he goes on to address certain objections. Some of these objections I hadn't even considered before, like this one. Um, Scripture was unnecessary before Moses, so why should it be necessary now? I mean, yeah, I guess that is a good point. Um, They didn't have the Bible before Moses wrote anything down, right? Some people argue that maybe the book of Job was written first, so maybe there was a book. But um, aside from that, there would have been a time when there was no written revelation, How do you address that objection? If it wasn't necessary then, why would it be necessary now? Well, here's what Turretin has to say. And I'm kind of paraphrasing him again. Before Moses, the so-called unwritten word. Do you remember I've been using the terms verbum agraphon and verbum angraphon in this class? So here he's talking about that verbum agraphon, the unwritten form of the word. It was more easily preserved on account of the longevity of the patriarchs, the fewness of the covenanted, and the frequency of revelations, although it suffered not a few corruptions. So circumstances were different back then. That's his basic argument. People lived longer, what, like 900 plus years before the flood. Um, There were fewer people. The, The population was smaller. And those who were covenanted with God were even smaller still. And also, they had more regular access to the revelations of God. So think of how frequently God appeared to the patriarchs. They just had more regular access to direct revelation from God. And because of that, written revelation was less necessary. The second objection Since new covenant believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the written word is no longer necessary. So this is a biblical argument, actually. They're using some biblical passages to make this objection. So you might be familiar with Jeremiah's new covenant prophecy in Jeremiah 31. Verse 34 says, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And similarly, 1 John 2.27 says, The anointing you received from him, from God, Christ, remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Well, if teaching is unnecessary, does that mean Scripture is unnecessary? Should I be out of a job right now? How would you address those verses? What do those verses mean? 
Oh, okay. That's a good point. So how does a person actually become a new covenant believer? It's by hearing the word of God. Okay. I'm going to play devil's advocate though. Let's say you get in by hearing the word, but then once you're in, you don't need it anymore. This is tricky. Let's see what Turretin has to say about it. He makes three points in response to this objection. He would say that holy, the Holy Spirit and Scripture are each necessary and effective, but in different ways. The one is necessary and effective internally, whereas the other is necessary and effective externally. They complement one another. They are necessary in different ways. Turretin also then makes a contrast with the Old Testament laws. He says the Holy Spirit in the New Covenant makes teaching unnecessarily not in an absolute sense, but only relatively compared to the Old Testament laws. So think of all like the symbols and the rituals that were used for teaching and instruction in the Old Testament. Those we have done away with because they were part of the Old Covenant types and shadows. And so the teaching within the New Covenant era, it's a simpler more purified form. That is the substance to which all the shadows were pointing. That's his second argument. And then his third argument, which I think is, in my opinion, the strongest, the promise of Jeremiah will be fulfilled completely someday, but only when we are in heaven and can see God face to face. I think that new covenant prophecy that Jeremiah was referring to, we're, we're getting a foretaste of it right now with the establishment of the new covenant, but we have not reached the consummation of that covenant yet. We're still in this tension between the already and the not yet. So some of those covenant promises are yet to be fulfilled. Um, We're we're seeing the beginnings of that fulfillment. So just just as like the teaching and the revelation of the the new covenant church is is simpler than all the types and ceremonies of the old covenant era, but we still, because we're still wrestling with the reality of sin um, in our own hearts, we still have a need for teaching. So that's Turretin's response to that objection. And the third objection that I'll, I'll, I'll show from him, Christ said that he is our only teacher. You might be familiar with this passage from Matthew 23, where Jesus says to the Pharisees, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. So if Christ is our only teacher, does that mean you don't need me? You don't need your pastors? What would you say? How do you know what Christ taught? That's right. I think what Christ is getting at here is claims to illegitimate teaching authority. That's what the Pharisees possessed or claimed to possess, right? They they were claiming an authority that was not theirs to rightfully claim. So here's how Turretin addresses that objection. Christ is our only teacher in such a sense that the ministry of the word is not thereby excluded, but necessarily included, which is kind of exactly what you were saying. How do we know what Christ teaches unless we are told through scripture? But necessarily included now, because now in it, only he addresses us and by it instructs us. So, for example, we can look at what Paul teaches in Ephesians 4.11, where it says that Christ gave to us the apostles and the teachers and the evangelists and so on and so forth. All of these teaching offices for the church are given by Christ. And so scripture itself affirms that the office of teaching is legitimated by Christ himself. Um, you might uh, also look at 1 Timothy 5.17, which says that let all elders who rule be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So this notion of a teaching ministry in the church is validated and legitimated by Scripture itself. So to continue the quote, Christ is not set in opposition to the Scriptures. Rather, he is set in opposition to the false teachers of the Pharisees who ambitiously assumed the authority due to Christ alone. So that's my summary of Turretin's argument for the necessity of Scripture. I'm going to wrap it up more briefly by looking at what Kevin DeYoung has to say about the necessity of Scripture. This chapter from his book, Taking God at His Word, essentially makes three different points regarding the necessity of Scripture. Scripture reveals a different wisdom, a different source, and a different love. All of this is based on um, his reflections on 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. I would encourage you to check out those um, Uh, verses when you have time. I'm not going to read the entire passage right now because we don't have time for that, but check out 1 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning in verse 17, 18, and all the way through the end of chapter 2, and you'll get um, an an understanding of what DeYoung is talking about. But he begins the chapter in in his comments on this passage uh, with these words. 
Most of us, deep down, want the same things out of life. Of course, I'm talking about ultimate things, not immediate things. On the immediate level, people have a wide variety of desires. Some people like to travel. Some people like fine dining. Some people prefer indoor plumbing and a comfortable bed. And other people like camping. There are a million different tastes, interests, and hobbies. But if we get to the level of the heart, I think people all around the world generally want the same things. We want purpose. We want to be happy. We want to know we are okay. We want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We want to be known by someone bigger than ourselves. We want to live forever. So if we look at the most ultimate longings of the human heart, where do we turn to have those longings satisfied? There is no other source we can go to than the words of Christ. That's how he begins his argument. And, he, and based on this principle, which is an empirical reality, just looking at the, the wiring of the human heart, the way we're hardwired, he concludes um, from that passage in 1 Corinthians that Scripture reveals a different wisdom, a different source, and a different love. And I'll comment briefly on each one of those. First, a different wisdom. So look at this section from that passage of 1 Corinthians. I'll, I'll, I'll share this excerpt for you. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. Just in that excerpt, how many times do you see the words wisdom or folly or related terms? At least six, maybe more. So what de Young is pointing out is that Scripture reveals a different wisdom. How is the wisdom of Scripture different from the wisdom of the world? What would you say? How is the wisdom of Scripture different from the wisdom of the world? It's the truth. Now, devil's advocate again. Couldn't you say that we can still know some things truly in this world? Like, even unbelievers know basic arithmetic. One is rooted in God, okay? The true God. Not just our intuitions about God, but God as he truly reveals himself. So yes, there's a greater clarity in Scripture's wisdom. Very good. If we look at the desires that each kind of wisdom satisfies, earthly wisdom can lead to the satisfaction of earthly desires to a limited extent. But our desires go much deeper than that. The deepest desires are not going to be satisfied by an earthly wisdom. Very good. Yeah, so um, you get the idea that the wisdom from above is um, a wisdom that points us to our ultimate source, our ultimate destination, the ultimate satisfaction of our longings. We can't discover those things on our own. And so um, it goes back to what Turretin said about the twofold appetite of man. Our, our, our appetite for truth and for goodness cannot be ultimately satisfied through earthly wisdom. And so similarly, we can look at de Young's argument about Scripture revealing a different source. So here's uh, another excerpt from that passage. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So according to this excerpt, what is the source of special revelation? What is the source of Scripture? What word is repeated here multiple times? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And as I've said in previous classes, the the Holy Spirit serves two purposes, fulfills two functions when it comes to Scripture. He's the source in the writing of Scripture, and we call that inspiration. But he's also the guide in the reading of Scripture, and we call that illumination. I think Paul is referring to both of those actions here because he talks about how, you know, we we are uh, teaching, imparting this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. I think that's a reference to the inspiration of Scripture. The we, I think, in this part of the text is referring to Paul and the apostles. This spiritual wisdom that they are imparting comes from the Holy Spirit, but it's also spiritually discerned. It can only be known through the Holy Spirit. So I think we have an affirmation of both inspiration and illumination in this passage. So, we have a different source for Scripture. 
And third, we have a different love revealed in Scripture. This goes back to the content of Scripture, um, what I refer to as the material cause for special revelation. What is the message that Scripture communicates to us? It's the word of the cross. So look at the, the next and final excerpt from that passage from 1 Corinthians. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then later Paul says, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So what is central to the message of scripture? It is the crucifixion of Christ. It is the message of the cross. And this reveals something that we cannot figure out on our own. This is something that goes contrary to earthly wisdom. It's the love of God as revealed in the death of his son. That is something that we only get through the word of God. That saving message, which shows us the depths of God's love for us. This is not something that is revealed through nature. General revelation doesn't teach this kind of self-sacrificial love of God. We have some idea of his benevolence towards us through creation. Look at all the gifts of creation and providence that God has provided for us. But we don't get a sense of God's sacrificial love for us except by looking at the cross. And how do we learn of the cross? It's through the word of God. That's what makes scripture necessary for us. So that is all I have for you for our lesson today. All right, well, should I pray for us? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that um, you have not left us in the dark. We recognize, Lord, that you have revealed truths about yourself through creation and through general revelation, but we also confess that that is not enough for our salvation. But you have given us the words of eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ, and through the inspired words of your prophets and apostles. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of Scripture, and we pray, Lord, that we would treasure it rightly in our minds and in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we would have the desire to meditate on it regularly, to reflect upon those saving truths, the way that Scripture reveals a different wisdom and a different source and a different love. And I pray, Lord, that that reality would transform us and make us more conformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.